you don't have any other chance, Rafael. So let's continue with the... Uh, Rafael, you have a single shot session. Oh, wow. Uh, that's a privilege. This is uh, incredible. We are very happy to have uh, Rafael Pusser. First time in Bilbao, I guess. Yeah, first yeah, time in Spain. From, that's first right. Oh, wonderful. First from Oak Ridge National Labs, uh, uh, collaborator and, and, and colleague, uh, who is going to tell us about uh, their work there. It's a lot of people, a lot of move in Oak Ridge National Labs, Department of Energy, and so on. And uh, please just settle after the coffee break and let us enjoy the talk. All right. That was a great idea, putting this after the coffee break. So uh, I'm extremely excited uh, to be here and also excited to be working with uh, Enrique's uh, group and uh, working closely with him and, and Mikel on a lot of quantum computing stuff right now. Um, so we have a huge project there that they're part of. That's very fun. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. I have no idea what's in this talk because uh, I don't even know when I made it. I was half asleep. I don't know how many typos we got. My hands are very shaky because I had three cups of coffee today. It's also cold, but I'm pretty sure it's the coffee. So let's see what's going on. But I'm going to take you on a trip. My journey of 15 years of quantum computing, starting from uh, uh, doing analog, analog computing with continuous variables, and uh, eventually passing over uh, to, what, to what those of us in the day uh, thought was the dark side over to discrete qubits. And um, actually, there's a hybrid, there's at least one guy working on hybrid regimes, named Furusawa in Japan, uh, working with both of them. Actually, we have a project at Oak Ridge that its goal is to combine uh, digital and uh, analog um, quantum simulation as well. So it's not so bad. Uh, uh, this picture in the background is pre-picture. I'm actually an experimentalist. Somebody came up to me earlier today and said, hey, you're a theorist, right? Shows how many experimental papers I've had over the past few years. But this is an experimental picture of some quantum optics in a, actually building a quantum computer with uh, tinfoil. Yep, there's tinfoil in this picture. Um, there's also a lot of cardboard. Turns out tinfoil and cardboard make up a lot of quantum computing. Uh, purple, pretty purple light. I had a student, oh, I better start this timer because I, uh, I could go on for a little while here. Um, sorry. Here we go. All right, so we had some summer students come in. They're shooting some lasers through some rubidium gas, making some qubits in there in the, in the rubidium. And uh, they see this purple light, and they come run into my office. I'm like, oh my god, look at this purple light. This is incredible. What is this? We've never seen this before. I'm like, I don't know, that's pretty normal. It's fluorescence, you know, shining a really strong laser. And they said, but you told us at the beginning of the summer that nothing happens inside this rubidium cell except for a two-photon Raman transition, and it's a totally closed system. So where the hell does purple light come from? I'm like, oh, OK. So they were super excited, thought they had seen something new and discovered something new, and took this awesome picture of it. And so now it's like the background of half of my talks. Uh, just have to get something out of the way here. Um, uh, there's a lot of stuff going on about philosophy right now. So uh, really, all the philosophies all just fit inside the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. The Heisenberg uncertainty principle, you see, provides us with the fuzziness within which any philosophy can be deemed correct or incorrect. And so, ergo, philosophies are all isomorphic. So I don't care if you're in many worlds or a Copenhagen or a Bayesian or whatever. Um, is the solution shove and calculate? Not for me, because I stink at it. I always just had a nuclear physics uh, workshop the other day, and they were all telling me that quantum noise reduction is hard. Quantum noise reduction, that squeeze light, that's when you reduce the noise floor and sensors using the same stuff that I'm going to be talking about in this talk. And everyone would say, oh, this is hard, this is hard. Uh, and there was a lot, much consternation at this conference if people should do or not do. So I got up there when in my talk, and I said, just shut up and let's do experiments and see if it's hard. And that's the approach that we take to quantum computing right now, at least at Oak Ridge. So uh, since I'm going to go on and undoubtedly have to be stopped before I'm done, I'm putting the thank you slide up front. So be careful for this guy. He's a Bayesian. Um, the rest of these guys are okay. This guy's a CV guy. Uh, this guy's a nuclear physics guy, nuclear physics guy, nuclear physics guy, uh, quantum optics kids. Uh, you guys know these guys. And everybody else, th these are two, oops, I've got a typo there. These are two uh, large quantum computing collaborations. So here's some people who are members of these, uh, of my uh, quantum computing project team. I don't, I don't think I have everyone, I, may, I think I've got everybody here. We got. Georgia Tech, Duke, a company called INQ, they make ion trap quantum computers. Uh, IBM, they make, you guys know what they do. 
uh, Virginia Tech, uh, Rigetti, you pro guys probably all heard of them too, superconductors. Um, Oak Ridge, of course, um, University of Washington, and of course, where we are today. Uh, so quick, um, or, or not so quick, advertisement, advertising time. I would like to advertise to you guys about one-way quantum computing. And there's probably at least two people in the audience who are intimately familiar with this concept. So this is a cluster state. And cluster state quantum computing is when you make a big old substrate of entangled states. Uh, these edges represent entanglement. Each node is a qubit or qdit. Doesn't matter for this picture. This is a graph representation of a quantum computer, whether it's qdit or qubits. Every edge represents a controlled phase or, or, a, uh, or a, a, a certain uh, continuous variable quantum operation. And what people want to do is get a whole bunch of these things entangled together and then perform measurements on nodes to propagate gates across the substrate. And the final measurement uh, at the end of the substrate will be your output of the quantum computation. And so these are just some papers that uh, um, deal with very recent advances in cluster state quantum computing where people have uh, entangled uh, thousands and even millions of uh, qubits together, or actually qubits in that case. And I was recently given a talk in Scott Aronson's group. You guys heard of Scott Aronson? <laughs> um, over at University of Austin. And he, so he's the chief D-wave skeptic. And I was, they had never, his students had never heard of CV, continuous variable one-way quantum computing. So I said, all right, yeah, this has been a million, 10 million, 10 million modes, this paper right here. Um, and uh, then I turned around and looked, and everyone was just like, and I said, OK, guys, look, why are you not saying, what? I thought there were only 50 qubits entangled together. That's what they got at Google. That's the max. And uh, nobody said anything. So, I, so then Scott said, OK, I'll bite. What? I thought there were only 50 qubits entangled together. So I had to explain, of course, how a million qubits doesn't do you a whole lot of good unless, of course, you also have a universal gate set, which we don't have in this, uh, uh, this picture yet, at least a deterministic version of that. Um, but we're working on that. So here's my version of that. I have a cl little cluster state in my lab. I don't have a million. I have four, but hey, it's scalable. So these are actual pictures of, of optical fields that come out of a rubidium vapor cell, and they, they fly around, and you detect them with homodyne detectors. You can see, so the entanglement is this guy is entangled with this guy, this guy is entangled with this guy, and then this guy is entangled with that guy, and that guy is entangled with, with that guy. So it makes a little box or an X if you have, if you have four, six, eight however many. And the way we make these things, since I told you guys I was an experimentalist, there's going to be some of that. So the way we make these things is uh, we interfere optical fields on beam splitters. Or what you do is you create an EPR state and you uh, concatenate those. So EPR states are what come out. This, is, this means OP, optical parametric oscillator. So EPR, optical parametric oscillators generate uh, states that are, oh, I don't have the, I should have put that, uh, integral over all x mode 1 in position x, mode 2 in position x. This is from the 1935 APR paper. OK, so it's the original, hey, quantum mechanics isn't good because it enables entanglement, or it predicts entanglement. Uh, the einstein pedelski rosen wrote 1935. Well, you can make states that look almost exactly like that by building one of these things. So uh, these things put out two either degenerate, well, well, either one degenerate mode or two non-degenerate modes. Output two non-degenerate modes, you can actually show that they're EPR entangled. If they put out de degenerate modes, you've got to interfere them to make entanglement. So I do this. So uh, how do you make a cluster state out of that? You just have a whole bunch of them. And the way you can concatenate them is interfere their neighboring modes. So you start out, this is a graph that represents two qubit entanglement. And you just have a whole bunch of two qubit entangled states. And you interfere all those guys with each other. And you stitch them together. And you should have. Uh, that graph then becomes this one. So of course, this wouldn't be really useful if you have to make n of these things. This is, a, uh, again, the, the nuclear physics guys told me it was hard to build these things. So um, uh, you know, if you have to make n of them, that's, you don't want to have to deal with that. So what people do is they multiplex them in time or frequency. And so what I, all I did was add uh, the spatial domain to the multiplexing. So this is a, let's just jump through that. This is an example of a spatially multiplexed Optical parametric amplifier, and not, you know, no, not a huge difference with an oscillator. You guys, ever seen pictures like this? Yeah, somebody in the back has. Um, 
if you're doing entanglement, you'll often see, you're probably more familiar in the, the discrete variable realm of entanglement where people talk about like spins and polarizations, right? Or like that. So um, they'll often talk about visibility. What's your visibility? And that tells you whether you have entanglement or not, right? They're plotting sine waves all over the place. These are sine waves on a log scale. So <laughs> sine waves on a log scale look like humps, but same thing applies. So in continuous variables, um, instead of vi violating Bell inequalities, which you can, uh, it's uh, instead what you do is you just uh, try to observe uh, the EPR paradox directly. That's what this picture tells you. It tells you what Einstein asked. Einstein said, well, if I measure x um, on particle one, then aren't I going to know what x is on particle two? And that's wrong, because <laughs> that would violate the Heisberg uncertainty principle. That was the, the thesis. Of course, it didn't violate any Heisberg uncertainty principle, right, because two separate particles, no simultaneous measurements of, of commuting, uh, non commuting observables actually happens, but this line here represents the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for semi-classical states, coherent states. Um, anything that goes below it uh, is into the Einstein spooky action at the distance territory, so sometimes your states for particular phases of a local oscillator that detects amplitude and phase of this optical field, sometimes they are entangled. This is nice. That means we made precisely one of these. Okay. <laughs> so then we just make uh, two of those, that's what this thing is doing. And so that we had some uh, students come in here and make, uh, they spatially multiplex it, so they just cut a beam. Now they have two beams. And they show that those guys are entangling each other, those guys are entangling each other. And uh, then what you do is interfere those on extra beam splitters. Uh, I don't expect you to follow this, by the way, I'm just flashing all this up fast, but you can, you can trust what I'm saying. Uh, or not, as the case may be. You know, pretty picture, lots of optics is required to do this. And uh, some t I showed this picture at uh, uh, a conference where there were like uh, nobody who did quantum optics. And so there were a bunch of gasps like, how do you ever expect to make quantum computing scalable if you have to have an optics table? And I'm like, well, well, guys, you should see the tables of other people, okay? There's like five mirrors in here for my table, all right? <laughs> this is this extremely, extremely simple experiment, okay? So, um, and the answer, of course, is that people are putting these on chips right now. Um, and uh, we actually do that at Oak Ridge as well, but I'm not gonna talk about any of that, any of the chip-based optics that we're doing today, because uh, I don't have time. Anyway, uh, you, you do all that jazz, and they're still entangled. Woohoo! except now a new thing's entangled. It's this thing, this is called stabilizer operator. Stabilizer operator is the thing that generates the cluster state. Yay, we made a cluster state, good. Uh, it remains to do a whole, lot of <laughs> a whole lot more before you can do quantum computing with that. Uh, and also it's not very entangled, um, but it's still entangled. Um, so y you, you, need, uh, you need to do some other quantum gates. So here I've only done one quantum gate, which is this apply stabilizer. Um, and uh, in addition to that, I'm gonna need some single qubit gates and I'm gonna need a, um, what's called a non-Gaussian operation. That's, uh, that describes the Wigner function of the, uh, uh, of the actual uh, state of all the qubits. So the reason I bring that up, this, the, the fact that you need this non-Gaussian Wigner function, is it's, it's a fairly technical point, but it turns out to play a huge role in a bunch of algorithms that have been developed recently. Uh, so, which makes sense because without this special gate, it turns out um, your, uh, your whole thing here, this whole uh, state here, is uh, classically simulable, right? Because I just said all I did was uh, apply a stabilizer operator to a collection of qubits. And if you have the keyword being stabilizer, everybody knows that uh, stabilizers are uh, uh, classically, efficiently classically simulable. So we need a special uh, extra gate, which I'll get to in a minute. Okay, so finally some machine learning. I went through all that because we're, we're actually trying to do quantum computing with this stuff, okay? This is mushy, highly mushy analog stuff. You didn't see any digital gates here, any qubits yet. But you can actually write a, uh, algorithms for this, for this thing that I just showed you. Um, so here's one about machine learning. So there's been, uh, there will be other machine learning. So th this one um, in this talk, but this, this one is actually just a translation of a lot of the very recent machine learning algorithms uh, for discrete qubit systems, okay? So uh, you had um, uh, shortest, uh, sh shortest distance between two vectors, uh, or sorry, just uh, computing the distance between two vectors, uh, matrix inversion, uh, support, vec uh, support vector machines, and, and others, a few of those. I think 
And this one total we did, let me see here. Uh, okay, here they are. Principal component analysis, matrix inversion, and, and vector distance. And on that last one, it requires an oracle. So oracles, if you paid attention during one of the other talks today, um, or most of the machine learning, uh, there's, there's several types of quantum machine learning. Um, one of them, one type, requires an, um, a quantum uh, register uh, in which you will embed an oracle. That's hard. So that's, that's sort of the hard version of quantum machine learning, in my opinion. That's hard. The other version of quantum machine learning is uh, you take a, I'll show it, talk about it later, you take a classical neural network and do quantize it in some way and somehow use the quantumness of that new quantum neural network to your advantage. An example of that would be uh, Boltzmann machines. So uh, deep learning, um, which is supported by Boltzmann machines that have visible and hidden layers. Um, everybody knows that you can't train uh, a fully interconnected Boltzmann machine. That's why we actually have uh, Boltzmann machines and these deep belief networks structured this way with layers. Uh, you, 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 uh, it becomes, a, uh, uh, I believe it's NP-hard at that point. So actually people do um, approximate methods to train these things. Well, uh, I, I think there's at least one person in this room or who will be here at this conference later who actually came up with an algorithm to train a fully interconnected version of a quantum Boltzmann machine. So that's totally different from, from making an oracle and querying it, okay? So those are the two things that I'm talking about. So this, this paper here was all about the, the, the oracle stuff. It wasn't about let's make a quantum Boltzmann machine or let's quantize the nodes or the edges. Um, so anyway, the key realization is that um, for, for continuous variables, um, you can actually do a very efficient encoding. So that's what's interesting here, um, compared to a classical oracle. And so as you can see the log there, that's good. Whenever you get <laughs> logs when it comes to quantum computing, you've done something. So um, however, it's very hard to implement. So most of these algorithms require this special gate here. So this is a controlled swap gate. Um, so you need to take an, and actually it can be an end mode controlled swap gate. So you're gonna have a collection of qubits in some state over here and a collection of qubits in some state over here, and then you need an ansel a qubit, and it's going to then take, swap their entire wave functions. So that sounds crazy, and it's hard. So let's see, uh, I think I have uh, how you do it. So, uh, so this is a cop out, right? Because all I did was just write it as a box. Don't worry, I'll show what's in the box in a minute. Just to show, the other stuff is easy, okay? So there's a controlled rotation required in here, actually. Um, that's easy stuff. That's linear optics. Um, so those are beam splitters and, and wave plates and things like that. Just applying Hadamard gates and things like that, okay? So those single qubit rotations. Controlled rotation in, is also very easy in, in, in uh, linear optics. So, um, uh, sorry, in, 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 in continuous variable version, not in, not in discrete version, but um, anyway. So you generate an Ansela, put him in some kind of superposition. He's going to be the control qubit. And of course, you need to put him in superposition so that he can uh, swap those guys in superposition. Swap these two qubits, the C and C prime are the, uh, the qubits, um, swap them in superposition. So, and there's a rotation in between, then we undo it. So, uh, let's see, what's inside there? So this is the part that's hard, and it turns out all of the machine learning algorithms that we derived use this piece. And inside this piece, so all the three that I showed you before, the, only reason, the reason why I have only one circuit diagram here is because they all kind of boil down. There's ancillary stuff around it, but all the circuits kind of boil down to this major piece here. So uh, this is the piece that I'm talking about, and there's yet another box. So this is called, let's see, what is this called? Uh, a repeat until success cubic phase gate. Okay, so we're doing a cubic phase gate. Um, what that means is that we have a Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian that, that this circuit uh, implements, or an eigenstate, the implements an eigenstate of, uh, is uh, nonlinear, has three powers of um, Bose operators in it. Okay, and that's what you need when, when I talked before about this universal gate set. That's one, of the, that's one way, anyway. That's what you need to generate this universal gate set. So this does it. Um, and essentially it does it via what's called a measurement-induced nonlinearity. You guys have probably heard of this before. So you do a thing where you collapse a wave function up here by subtracting a photon from it. Um, plenty of people have done this, but there's another 
hard part that's been swept under the rug. This has already been done experimentally, though. So now we're getting into the realm of real life. Um, this was done by uh, a group in Japan, uh, Merrick, and uh, was the first author. And of course, that was Akira Furusawa, uh, his group. So this um, thing is too, too dense to label it all. But this, this thing is called a quantum non-demolition summing gate. Um, the upshot is this thing uses all Gaussian resources and linear optics. In other words, the Hamiltonian of this thing is um, quadratic in the Bose operators. So this is good. It means you can do it efficiently. And they did. Um, it's still hard. I've never done it. <laughs> so you need to do all of this just to do a machine learning algorithm on a continuous variable uh, quantum computer. Um, so that's all I want to say about that algorithm because I have taken no additional steps to actually implement this algorithm yet. Um, uh, and that's all I'm going to say about continuous variable quantum computing. But we can talk more about it during question time because uh, I need to hurry along here. Have you guys seen this quantum neural network? Uh, OK, that's fairly generic. Of course, you've seen a quantum neural network before. But this one, this particular one is in Japan called QNN Cloud. And it's called an optical icing machine. And this thing does, well, of course, it does machine learning. This thing can be used to approximate a Boltzmann machine. And they also claim that it can be used to implement a quantum Boltzmann machine. This thing is an all-to-all connected uh, network of icing spins. Um, this is really, and I have no role in this except that I have a project at Oak Ridge. Uh, so I'm, I'm co PI, I should say. It's another guy's project on a project at Oak Ridge uh, to simulate this thing to find out whether or not it's really quantum. So Scott Aronson was here. He'd say, well, that looks a lot like D Wave uh, to me. And that's because it does look a, lot, look a lot like D Wave to me, too. And therefore, it's probably not quantum. But we don't know. Uh, the reason why it's claimed that it's quantum. That's what Scott Aronson would say, not me, D-Wave people. Um, OK, so I, I don't have a, an official stance on the topic yet until I'm done simulating this. So, and by the way, if I can simulate it efficiently, it probably isn't quantum. So um, this is cool to me because this thing uses a bunch of optical parametric oscillators, the thing I just got through telling you about, OPOs. But it turns out OPOs don't always have to make EPR states, right? Actually, it's kind of hard to make sure that they do. It's much easier to op operate them as phase sensitive or phase insensitive amplifiers in the classical regime. These guys put a whole bunch of them, multiplex together, mix their outputs, feed them back onto to the inputs, and uh, it collapses. The total state uh, phase of the output state collapses to either plus pi or minus pi. And so that's digitized as a computation. And so you can think of that as the output of a, uh, uh, the output nodes of a Boltzmann machine, of a deep belief network or something. So you adjust the weights of the couplings in here, and there you go. You have your interconnected IC. So it's a hot field network, right? But they can simulate a Boltzmann machine with it um, fairly easily by uh, making these weights uh, temperature depend, uh, you know, it's a faux temperature. But they can make those things vary according to a Boltzmann distribution. They can also just make it be a hot field network. OK, so this thing does, let's see what problems I think. Oh, so this is, just so you know, I'm not crazy. This guys are the real deal. They got two papers back to back in the same issue of science. I only cited one of them here. So two back to back papers, same group of people. I don't know how you do that. One paper said 2,000 all to all. The other paper said 100 all to all, uh, connect, uh, 200 all to all connections. So this is, I'm not going to draw 1,000, but this is the classical version, hidden layers here, right? Quantum version, fully interconnected. So the problems that they say they solve are Cubo problems, which is what D-Wave does. They say that they can do max cut and sat. Um, they can implement Boltzmann machines. I'm excited to, so there's a paper on this. I, I should have put the reference in here. Sorry about that. But you can Google, just Google optical icing machine Boltzmann machine. You'll find it. Um, so so uh, I'm kind of excited about all of that. And this is sort of the early days for this thing. But you can go, they have a, a cloud thing. You can go get an account just like they have on IBM. So um, I've signed up for IBM, obviously, but not, not this one yet. Um, but we're simulating it. So this is what I was telling you before, the output. This is Monte Carlo. So the output collapses to one of two phases. So it's a whole bunch of OPOs. Well, uh, I spent, uh, I've been doing this for 15 years. I've probably spent seven years simulating OPOs. So I should know how to do that. So we can build an OPO simulator and, um, and um, link a bunch of them together and see if we can simulate what the icing machine 
does, if we can simulate exactly what it does for very large numbers of potentially qubits, then um, unfortunately we'll probably declare that it's not quantum. But if we cannot, uh, and of course we have uh, just getting ready to flip the switch at Oak Ridge on the, on the uh, world's biggest supercomputer, um, which will probably be that way for a few months before some other country builds something bigger. Uh, I don't know a lot of such things, but Summit is our next supercomputer. We're going to put this thing on Summit, so this is just running on my laptop. It's a, a few hundred uh, Monte Carlo iterations. Um, and see how many interconnected nodes in an optical icing machine can we simulate. And then, of course, we need to do something useful like do a max cut sat or, or SAT problem on it. Um, so we already have some problems lined up to do that. But for now, this is all I have for you to look at. OK, so um, wow, I am really, what do I got, like five minutes? <laughs> I'm really uh, going long here. OK, so um, this is uh, taking that concept of, of this guy and going one step further um, into the neuromorphic computing domain. So I'm not going to go into the details about this. Suffice to say, these devices, which operate as PSAs or phase sensitive or phase insensitive amplifiers, can be coupled to both quantum and classical fields simultaneously and can be made to exhibit spiking behavior. So this is a simulation of, of one of these guys uh, with two of them coupled together. And it's very easy, actually, to induce them to make spiking behavior. Um, now, have, I haven't done a large-scale neuromorphic um, quantum optical <laughs> uh, simulator yet. This is just two nodes. But uh, if the other one's efficient, this one will also be efficient to simulate. So uh, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go too deep into that. All right, so now I have to do something never before done in a, uh, look at that, OK. So, because um, I had to change to 16 by 9. So, all right, we have in the last, I'm going to go with five minutes. In the last, <laughs> um, this, we, we have a big program on the digital domain of quantum computing. Um, and it's got, I, I went over the partners at the beginning, but we're covering this whole stack about how to program quantum computers. The, the goal of the project, let me just jump to the next slide. Uh, and these are um, our collaborators also through um, this other program that we have at Oak Ridge about quantum algorithms teams. So we have a very wide-reaching collaboration. So the goal is determine the feasibility of running scientific applications on near-term quantum computers. What is near-term? You guys, you guys all know John Presco, right? So he said that we are in the what he calls the NISQ era, near intermediate scale quantum. What's that? Noisy. <laughs> Noisy. Sorry. That's yes, absolutely. That's right. Very, very noisy. We're talking, and you'll see. You'll see when I show you the results here. Uh, yeah, extremely noisy. Um, so we're in the noisy intermediate scale quantum era. And what do we do with uh, what do we do with quantum computers in this era? That's what this project's about. Um, we have a whole bunch of other quantum computing partners that people can get access to in this user facility that we have called Quantum Computing Institute. So yes, we have a D-Wave in there. It's going to stay inside the quantum part just until, until such time as somebody else determines otherwise. This will be a quantum computer in our quantum computing institute. Um, and uh, and uh, Google, of course, uh, we're, they're not part of our testbed project, but we work with them. Um, these guys actually make a simulator, so it's not a, a, a quantum computer. It's a quantum simulator. But you can log in and play with that. Um, pretty pictures of quantum computers. I'm going to jump through that because I'm going way too long. Uh, feasibility just means. Um, you know, how can, as a function of some metrics, for instance, this one's called quantum volume that IBM came up with. As a function of some metric, how accurate is your simulation if you're doing a quantum simulation? Um, another way of putting that would be, what's the distance from this, from this line where the line is simulated and the, the black line is simulated and the blue is the data or the red is the data? Just what's the distance? And for machine learning purposes, which we will do, uh, machine learning purposes, metrics such as the distance from that line is our cost function. So we're going to optimize quantum circuits and our ANSATs for state preparation when we do quantum simulation. All right. So the other thing John Preskill said besides in this queue was, what is quantum simulation right now? State prep, evolve, measure. That's it. So we have state prep step that we can optimize with machine learning. So we're working on that right now. I'm going to skip this one. All right. Everybody has probably seen this. This is from an um, Asper Guzik paper. Um, it's about... Uh, variational quantum eigensolvers. So state prep, uh, there's an evolution here, <laughs> and, then evo and then measure. Um, so I'm going to jump through these. This is the, I'm very near the end of the talk now. So we have done two, uh, as a part of this,
project, we've done two interesting new uh, quantum simulations. So the first one was this um, quantum computing of an atomic nucleus. All right, to give you an idea of how NIST-Q are we, uh, this was done on three qubits, and the total number of gates, let me see if I can find it, four C knots, okay? We couldn't do more than four C knots, or our result actually would get worse um, as we tried to approximate the ground state of the Hamiltonian better. Uh, okay, so what we're doing here, this is state prep for an ANSATS, a trial ANSATS wave function to, to approximate the eigenstate of the Hamiltonian. The more gates we put in, this is like trotterization, right? The more gates we put in, the closer we get to the real wave function. We couldn't go beyond this, uh, otherwise approximating the wave function better theoretically was actually worse on the machine. So that's what we mean when we say NISQ and very noisy. But nonetheless, it works really well. So the, this is, don't worry about, the, these, this is the energy, so simulated result and our data fell within, this is actually uh, two point something percent accuracy. So not chemical accuracy, but this is nuclear physics. So uh, since that's the first quantum nuclear physics calculation, we have the best accuracy. <laughs> so, um, uh, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna jump through the systematic error stuff and we can talk about it if you have questions because I wanna get to the second one, actually this, that stuff's kind of important, but I don't have time to talk about it. Um, the second one is, uh, and this is the last one, um, uh, quantum field theory. So we came up with a CV algorithm of it, of course, but now since I'm on the dark side, we need to convert this to a discrete uh, theory. Actually, John Preskill already did that for us. We, this, this paper was just about converting his to CV. So um, what we did was we took the Schwinger model and implemented it on uh, two sites. So two sites, two spins per site makes four points. Okay, so the Schwinger model is a quantum field, second quantized field theory, right, for electrons and positrons. So we're just asking, we're just doing this, we're saying, what is the probability that I'll get an electron-positron pair at one of my spatio-temporal lattice locations? And we have two of them. So, I don't know why I held up four fingers, sorry, two. <laughs> Okay, so, um, all right, complicated calculation to do. The point here is that this is a real tour de force in fitting a large problem on a small computer. We used, we used a total of, of between two and four qubits to do that problem because, again, we're really noisy. Um, you may be want, sitting there wondering to yourself, Oop, if you've done, my, I'm out of time, but I'll say real quick, you're probably wondering, like, well, if, if uh, Google and IBM recently did simulations where they used like six qubits, you know, they used many qubits, longer circuit depths, they did H2, they did uh, lithium hydride. Um, so what gives? Why are we only using so few qubits? Well, it turns out that, um, think about what we're doing actually. I'm sitting at my desk in Oak Ridge. I'm actually logging in to IBM's quantum computer to run these simulations. So that's kind of already mind blowing. Um, we're running them remote control, all of these simulations. So we don't have control over the, the, the little knobs, the, 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 the subtle things that you'll need control over to do a really high, uh, high circuit depth simulation. So to get those high circuit depths beyond these few gates that we're doing, uh, you're gonna to need to talk to the hardware directly, not send chasm. So these are digital gates, we're talking C knots, whereas you know what they do actually, in reality, IBM is what's called cross resonance, where each uh, new, uh, microwave resonator is driven at the resonance frequency of the others. That's different from a, exactly from a C naught. So, um, so yeah, we have a slightly reduced circuit depth. Uh, you can't. Even, I don't know if you can see the gray area here at all. Can you? I cannot see it from where I'm standing. There's like a gray area right about, but you can actually see a crossover point. So here's trotterization. So th we do a lot of error correction. I glossed over that. Error correction makes things better below some certain point. Past some certain point in time, the more trotter steps you have, decoherence, so trotter steps equivalent to circuit depth, decoherence kills you. So it's just a restatement of what I said before. We have to do a ton of work to fit this on a, a, small, uh, a small quantum computer. And uh, let me just jump to the conclusion. Oops, I don't even know why I came back to this talk. I should have just put the conclusion on the other slide. So uh, we're doing pretty good in this NISQ era, we're about at the computational power level of the 1970s, uh, 60s or so. So this is not bad considering uh, how long we've been at it. So um, that's it. Thank you.
thanks, Rafael, for this uh, entertaining talk. Interesting. Any questions? Not a single one. You have to wake up. Yep. Alejandro. So the question is about like when you compare, I'm not that familiar with the CV actually model, okay. particularly in quantum machine learning. So the, when you compare to the digital uh, approach, like what do you think actually is the main advantage or actually the, the main challenges for this model to, to compete or to... Or you yeah, actually, so that's a good point. So what's, what's supposed to be, uh, un until you're fault tolerant, um, what we've seen is that uh, the benefit of having digital gates is not as um, enormous as you would expect in a, from your experience in classical computing. Okay, so in classical computing, uh, and I'll, I'll get to the answer. So in classical computing, you, uh, you got all this noise and you just threshold and say, okay, everything's good. Um, that's because everything's fault tolerant from the very start or very close to it, right? So in quantum, when we, uh, when we force ourselves to, to take this analog system that's messy and force it to be digital, it doesn't actually um, work as well as we'd like. And so the advantage to doing these analog versions are that you can have those smaller circuit depths that you need right now. So this, it's all about circuit depth. So why trotterize a unitary Hamiltonian evolution operator if you could just implement that operator directly? So, so the advantage really is only that. It's a, um, when, thing, when everything's fault tolerant, the both, the both will be formally, both classes will be formally equivalent to each other once we're fault tolerant. Thanks. Any other question? Yep. Just a curiosity. Can you say a few words about how did you generate these spiky patterns just with you? Uh, yeah, yeah, back to the neuromorphic thing. Um, let me just pull that up. Oh, it was like here. Yeah, so. Um, so what do you need to generate a, 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 a neural net? Well, it's basically just a, a, a nonlinear transfer function. So like reservoirs are a very good optical, or any kind of reservoir is a good example of a nonlinear transfer function. You just have this network that you plop down, and you, uh, it's got some input and output, and you just have something highly nonlinear happen in between, and you can use that to do learning. This is the same thing. So, so, so this, so these are two amplifiers. Both of the, all amplifiers, it turns out, are nonlinear, right? They, they have, uh, if you trace over one of the modes. So these amplifiers have two inputs and two outputs, and it mixes the two inputs, so it's nonlinear um, in the classical sense. Some, some people might say, it's, oh, that's not nonlinear because it's quadratic or it's Gaussian. But I say, okay, this is nonlinear. So um, you just need to mix a whole bunch of modes together, and uh, it's very easy to get um, things to, uh, bunch in time very closely when you do that through some um, uh, uh, field depletion um, events. So what happens is these amplifiers, if one acts as the pump for the other, then um, its pump will become depleted very rapidly if the coupling between those two modes, the nonlinear coupling, is very high. And so that, what that does is like saturates a gain as if it were a laser. But um, once, that, once that happens, um, after some period of time, the losses in the cavity, so this is, a, this is a damping term here, the damping actually couples that energy out, so that's like the neuron firing. At that point, we, the, the, pole, the, the, the voltage goes down, it's gone, right? And so then we're ready for, to build up again in the cavity through this gain process. So it's a gain loss, there's a gain and there's a loss for every uh, field. It doesn't have to be optical, but this is the optical implementation of it. So it's, it's actually um, kind of like, it's not quite chaotic, but it's kind of like it's a high, not highly nonlinear network. So allow me to make the last question for you. Okay. Um, you mentioned the easing model uh, in the work of Japanese groups and yeah. companies, even. Yeah. And uh, also your efforts in that direction. Uh, just as a combined couple of questions, do you think uh, interacting spin models is natural? for implementing in, in photonics. And uh, in combination to it, what would be the most natural models uh, to, to, to implement, be in this yeah. bulk approach or yeah. also in the integrated photonic chips? Yeah, that's a good question. Like, is this a natural thing to implement in optics? 
and um, the folks, so this is um, Yamamoto and, uh, um, and others, um, a, a company called NTT in Japan. Um, uh, they, would, uh, they would argue, um, so I don't know the answer to the question, but I think that they would argue that this is a natural implementation for any, any two-level system and what they do. But here's where it gets weird. Um, as you can see, the separation between these two solutions is very large. And so this machine, this nonlinear network, undergoes some evolution from very small uh, field amplitudes to, to large, very well separated ones. And so it seems to make a transition to a classical regime. And so a quantum spin model, I don't know. That's, that's where the question comes in as to whether or not this thing really is quantum or not. Like if all the quantumness is happening down here before the separation of those two um, solutions, then uh, I, I have no idea <laughs> whether it's quantum or classical. So a better, a better approach, um, actually if you look to um, some of these, uh, I don't know, I wouldn't say better, but uh, actually there were um, a couple of uh, simulation, uh, simulation results um, out of IBM and others where they're using the, um, the, actual, the qubits themselves, of course, as spins. Just like, you know, of course, D-Wave does. So it's, it just has to be a two-level system. So here, it's like, is it two-level when it's quantum versus when it's classical? I, I don't know. That's a good question. Yes, thanks, Raphael, then, and thanks to everybody for the session.